uh, our hour together today. Let's uh, let's begin with a, a selection from the 118th Psalm. I think it's one that is sets the right tone for our celebration today. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builder rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I realize as I'm taking the pulpit right now that I skipped a part of our service that we that we usually have. It's usually a part of, of most church church worship gatherings that you have been a part of. Sometimes it's the minister who does it. Sometimes it's the worship leader. I usually do it at the beginning of our service, but I forgot to do the announcements. So let me take the moment now to do the announcements. I'm kidding. I'm not going to do announcements right now. <laughs> but you should uh, take a look at the back of your bulletin. There are some important things that you might want to might want to be aware of. Although the truth is, I cannot skip announcements altogether. There is one announcement that I have to make, and truly, it, it's the only reason I'm really here today. It's the only reason I'm dressed up like a used car salesman today. <laughs> and that is, I have to make the announcement that on this morning, just before dawn, about 2,000 years ago, God raised Jesus from the dead. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. That's what I'm here to do today, is to make that announcement. I chuckled a little bit and when Jeannie was praying, and, and it's a good message, but she says that sometimes the word of the Lord comes in that still, quiet voice. And then there's my voice, <laughs> which I don't believe has ever been described as such. But I'm here today to announce that Christ is risen. Amen. Now, there is, of course much more that I could say about this announcement and what it means for us. The New Testament is just full of, of rich metaphors describing that this announcement, really doing just that, telling us, making the announcement and telling us what it means to us. We know that if Christ is risen, then God must truly be in charge of everything which is good news because if God is in charge, that means that the Caesars of the world are not. Jesus' res resurrection points us to ideas of renewal, of restoration. It's a foretaste of what's to come. It points to newness of life. If Jesus is risen, then that new heaven and that new earth spoken about in the 21st chapter of Re Revelation, sang about by Jerry this morning, is truly coming. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, and this is the message of Easter, 
See, I am making all things new. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. The fact that Jesus is risen tells us that when we pray, as Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. We aren't simply praying in vain. That prayer was answered on Easter Day and will finally be answered fully one day when our world as we know it, our heaven, our earth are brought into that new heaven and that new earth that are described in Revelation 21. The risen Christ is hope for that in person. The whole point of the New Testament is not just to make the announcement of the risen Christ, though that is a huge part of it, but it's, it's also about what those of us who have heard that announcement, that is who have truly heard it, and the Old Testament sense, that is we've heard the announcement and we intend to do something about what we've heard. Well, what the, the New Testament also tells us what it is that we should in fact do. We certainly just don't sit around and wait and hope for uh, that, that final realization in Jesus to happen. No, we take up the hard work of living as Easter people. That's why I like to point out the fact that Easter is, is not just one day. According to the Christian calendar, we have 50 days to celebrate Easter. And as far as I'm concerned, we have 365 days yeah, yeah. to celebrate Easter. As N.T. Wright put it, our task in the present is to live as resurrection people. Yeah, yeah. If the news that Jesus Christ is raised is, in fact, to be believed, as I, as I believe it is, then that has an effect on our lives. We are to live as resurrection people in between Easter and the final day. Yeah. With our Christian life, corporate and individual, in both worship and mission as a sign of the first and as a foretaste of the second. The Apostle Paul, at times, he compares going down into the waters of baptism as, as dying together with Christ and coming out of those baptismal waters as being raised to new life with him. And so we truly are Easter people. And when we look back and we reflect on our on our baptismal vows, it's that that we should think about. Going down into the grave with Christ and rising with him and to new life. Yes. Which, by the way, in two weeks from this Sunday, we'll be holding a baptismal service. And if you have never made a, taken that step of being baptized, I would invite you to, to approach me and, and talk with me about that. We'd love to include you in that service. In Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1, we read, So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on these things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. And that's a good message. There's a problem there, though. And that is that I, I think that a lot of contemporary Christian belief, and this is not necessarily to our credits, essentially stops there. But that's, that's not the, all there is to the story. We can't just stop there. We must read on. Yes. And if we read on, eventually we'll come to these words uh, written by the Apostle Paul. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as, uh, just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. Above all, clothe, your, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Yes. Amen. Amen. So that is as much a part of the announcement of the empty tomb as simply it are the words, he is risen. 
The announcement of the empty tomb is the announcement that compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, forgiveness, peace, and above all, love reigns. That should have gotten an amen. Amen. I mean, I, 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 maybe it cheapens it a little bit if I ask for one, but it just felt like that deserved one. Now, what I'm about to say uh, is not a, it's not a legitimate gripe. Don't take it that way. It's, I, I'm more like just poking fun at some of the common tropes that exist around church culture. But, but that is that, and we know this is true, that announcements are not always heard. We tend to tune out the minister during announcements time. Something might be printed in the bulletin. It might be on the screen prior to the service. It might be on our Facebook page and announced from the pulpit. But some folks will inevitably still forget about the next pitch in dinner or the next meeting or the next food drive or whatever it might be. And that's no different when it comes to the announcement that Jesus is risen and all it entails. That actually is a difficult announcement to hear. Jesus warns us that if we go out to make that announcement, that it's like sowing seed. Some of the seeds fall on the hardened path and never even have a chance to take root before they get trampled or eaten up by the birds of the air. (coughs) We heard at the beginning of our service today the story of an angel telling Mary and the other Mary that Jesus was raised from the dead. And that reading was from the Gospel of Matthew. We read a we, or we could we could read a similar story that we find in the Gospel of Mark. And Mark's gospel, he says that the women ran away terrified and didn't tell anyone. Some announcements are hard to hear. Luke tells us that even seeing Jesus, there was disbelief among his disciples. John tells us that one of Jesus' disciples said he, he couldn't believe unless he touched. Jesus' wounds. Some announcements are hard to hear. He said he wouldn't believe unless he touched Jesus' wounds. His wounds. Probably part of the reason that the announcement is hard to hear. Because we can't forget that behind the announcement that Jesus is risen is a crucifixion. There is no Easter without the cross. No Easter without Good Friday. And if we couple that with all that we read in the New Testament about bearing our own cross and about trouble coming the way of those who would proclaim the gospel, then yeah, the Easter announcement is a hard one to hear. I've served in a few churches even before I became a a member of the clergy. I volunteered. I did other things at at, at other churches that I had been a part of. And before I was in seminary, while I was in seminary. And in all of those experiences, I was blessed to serve alongside quite quite a few truly wonderful people. People who really loved Jesus. Some were paid uh, paid clergy, some were students preparing for that path. Others were just lay leaders with big hearts for Jesus. And I found that most of us really did have a strong resolve to keep doing what it was we were doing. But it was tough sometimes. If one of the people that I was working alongside, myself included, maybe was not feeling discouraged or burnt out, then one of our co-workers was. And discouragement and burnout was right around the corner for for us as well. A lot of clergy members I've known struggle knowing that all their peers make more money than them. A lot of other servants give up lots, give lots of themselves. They give a lot in terms of their time, their energy, their resources. And sometimes those thoughts creep in. Is it all worth it? We know of a great lesson that that Jesus taught us about a poor widow who put two little coins into the temple coffers. And that's all she had to give. But she was still rich and she still gave more than everyone else did. That's a great lesson. 
That'll preach, as they say. And that's why many of us do what we do. We want to follow Jesus in the path of generosity. Still, that's a tough path to follow when so many around us choose the path of profit or of comfort or of preference. It's hard to carry on knowing an easier life could be had. But then again, could is that really true? Could an easier life be had? I'm reminded of a story that was told by one of my favorite pastors and, and Christian educators, the late Reverend Fred Craddock. And the story is about a businessman who was on the news at some point. This was probably like 15, 20 years ago, something like that. Because he had built uh, the largest house ever built in northern Georgia, which is where the Reverend Craddock was serving at the time. And I understand that this house, I mean, the largest house built in that region, I'm sure it was quite a sight to see. And the Reverend tells a story about how he, he got to meet this businessman who built the house. And, uh, and what this businessman said to him was, would you believe that I started out in ministry? Now look at me. And the reverend asked, why did you do this? Why, why did you build this house? And the response was simply, because I can. To which the reverend replied, you can't afford this house. It's a pretty powerful message, I think. I've heard a lot of the people that I've worked with in ministry, whether serving in youth group or working to provide food and clothes to, to those in need in the community, talk about how tired they get, tired of being the only one who shows up. A lot of times they get started and they're really excited, eager to serve, but they quickly feel like they're, they're on a ship with a dozen oars, but they're the only one who's rowing. I think Jesus put up with some of that. And so I can't speak for all the wonderful people that I've had the pleasure to, to minister alongside. But if someone were at, to ask me, why do you do what you do? Well, it's because of that announcement I made earlier. And it's not just the announcement of the resurrection. What I mean is it's, it's not just that God raised somebody from the dead, but that God raised Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. Uh, something else the, the Reverend Craddock wrote is, who was raised from the dead? Not King Herod, who tried to stab the baby while it was still in its cradle. Not Pontius Pilate, who, as the, the governor screamed in the face of Jesus and said, don't you know that I have the power to kill you in this minute? Not Tiberius Caesar, who sat, in, in, sat like a, a marble statue in Rome and said... I have nothing really to do with peasants, especially Jewish peasants. What was his name again? Jesus? Never heard of him. Who was raised from the dead? Jesus of Nazareth. And do you know what that means? It means that God lifted up that person, Jesus of Nazareth, and said, this is the one that I have vindicated. This is the one I affirm. This is the one I confirm. This is the one I exonerate. This is the one that tells you, this is what I had in mind when I created you in my own image. And look at him, totally without violence. Anyone else who is, is striving hard for the kingdom of God, but who is struggling, who wants to hang up your hat, call it quits, pick an easier way. I just want to remind you, that it was Jesus of Nazareth who God vindicated on that day. God vindicated Jesus whose way is compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, and above all, love. It was nonviolent Jesus who was vindicated. It was turn the other cheek and love your enemy, Jesus, who was vindicated. It was how many times should I forgive Jesus? Seven, no, 70 times seven who was vindicated. And Jesus' way is the way of endurance. Jesus, who endured the cross, 
is the one that God had in mind when he made me and you in God's own image. Yes. And that's why I strive on for the kingdom. That's why I strive on to live as an Easter person. Because of the one God vindicated. Because I love the one that God vindicated. Amen. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord, having heard this announcement about you being risen, about the one who was vindicated, Lord, may we just center our hearts and our minds on you this morning. We can center ourselves on Jesus just by speaking his name. Yes. Speak it with me. Jesus. And Lord, we're just so grateful for the news that, that you are indeed risen and all that that means for us. Thinking of that passage in Revelation, we know that it means that pain and suffering, not even death, have the last word. Yes. But that you, God, have the last word. Yes. I think about that especially today, knowing even that um, some of our, our church family, although I know they want to be, can't be here today because they're wrestling with illness, pain, suffering of their own. So, Lord, I, I just uh, I, I take all of those things that we struggle with in life and not to trivialize them. I know that they are indeed there are indeed profound struggles. But, Lord, I just uh, I thank you for the nails of, of the cross, the, what you endured for us knowing that we can lay all of those things before you. Yes. We thank you, Lord, that, um, that the most profound act of love that you, you performed for us was an act of humility yes. Yes. and sacrifice. Yes. And I thank you, Lord, that, that you vindicated the one who gave so much for us. Yes, yes, Lord. And it's in his name I pray. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Amen.